Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let us continue our discussion on review of the course. In fact, in lecture 30, I have given a review of the course done till that time. And this review lecture, you can take it as a continuation of that. So, if you look at these two review lectures, you have a complete perspective of what the course is all about. You know, the main focus of this course is to look at what is the typical variation of stress in an axially loaded member, in a beam subjected to pure bending and a shaft subjected to pure torsion. And you know, we have done this based on inference of photoelastic fringes, at least for uh, axial loading and bending. And when you look at for axial loading, it is uniformly distributed. On the other hand, when I look at it uh, for uh, torsion, this is varying as a triangle, this is the variation of shear stress and if you move on to the beam which is transmitting a constant bending moment, here again you have a triangular variation, but this variation is for a normal stress which is known as bending stress and uh, you know whole of this course centers around development of this uh, torsion formula and then you were uh, bending formula and for an axially loaded member the elongation equal to PL by AE is a useful relation which will use it in other context of the course also. And you know we have seen that uh, you have a simple tension test to find out the Young's modulus and yield strength. And you can also use the same tension test to find out the Poisson's ratio. So, you have uh, ASTM standards available for this and uh, one way is to put a strain gauge uh, transverse to the loading and you measure the strain transverse to the loading and also along the loading direction and Poisson's ratio is given as uh, minus of transfer strain divided by the longitudinal strain. And you have a ASTM standards uh, D3039 which lists out what precautions you need to take to measure Poisson's ratio. And we have also looked at there is a drastic reduction of the cross section when the material uh, reaches the necking point. So, it is better that you consider the variation in the cross section and if you plot the true stress as P by A i as the current area of cross section and also define strain as L naught to L d L by L, L and L by L naught, you have a true strain graph. Instead of drooping down after necking, this will increase as until the ultimate tensile strength. And we have also looked at uh, the stress strain relations because in a tension test you apply load only in one direction. When I have all the stress components exist, the normal strains are related to normal stress and shear strain is related to only the respective shear stress. So, that is the speciality of isotropic material, it makes our life extremely simple. When I move on to an anisotropic material, a normal stress can introduce shear and a shear stress can introduce normal strain and normal stress. So, it is very complicated to handle. So, it is uh, also known as generalized Hooke's law in a simplistic sense and we have also looked at how many elastic constants that you require to characterize an isotropic material because we have seen uh, what is Young's modulus uh, E, shear modulus G and Poisson ratio nu and we have also developed the bulk modulus. So, we have four of them discussed. Out of this four, how many are required to characterize an isotropic material? 
So, if you develop the interrelationship and for interrelationship what we have looked at is we have effectively used the Mohr circle of stress and strain for an isotropic material. If you scale them appropriately, the same uh, principal stress directions or same as principal strain direction. So, you can look at what happens by re-looking the shear stress, pure shear stress as combination of a tension and compression and invoking the uh, stress strain relations, it is possible to establish an interrelationship between Poisson's ratio, Young's modulus and shear modulus. So, you have this from the strain transformation law and you have the definition of uh, gamma x y based on uh, stress transformation and also this more circle of strain, you can simply write this as epsilon 1 minus epsilon 2. And from your stress strain relation, I have gamma x y is tau by g. And when you look at from your understanding of principal stress and strain, I can write out independently epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. When I substitute it back, I get a very interesting relation g equal to e by 2 into 1 plus nu. On similar lines, we have also looked at how to find out the interrelationship between bulk modulus, Poisson ratio and Young's modulus. For that, we developed the concept of volumetric strain that is simply addition of all these normal strains. Volumetric strain is nothing but epsilon xs plus epsilon yy plus epsilon zz. Using this, we have uh, revisited what is bulk modulus. It is given as pressure by volumetric strain and that we got the expression 3 sigma 1 minus 2 nu divided by E equal to sigma by k. And from this you get k as E by 3 into 1 minus 2 nu. So, what you find here is it is enough you have only two elastic constants to characterize an isotropic material. It is the greatest simplification that we have achieved. Okay, and we have also looked at what are the extremum values of uh, Poisson ratio. When uh, nu is 0.5, k becomes infinite, volumetric strain becomes 0, the material becomes incompressible. And uh, when nu is minus 1, you have the other story for g. So, the bounding values for the Poisson ratio is from minus 1 to 0.5. And we have seen cork is a very interesting material, it has a Poisson ratio is 0. Whereas, rubber has a Poisson ratio of 0 0.5 and uh, we have also seen negative Poisson ratio comes to advantage when you want to develop a stent for all your uh, arteries and uh, other blood vessels. And uh, the generalized Hooke's law for an, uh, if you are considering uh, anisotropic materials, how these are related. Independently, we have 9 uh, stress components and 9 strain components. So, you may think that you may require 81 elastic constants. We have this as sigma i j equal to capital E i j k L. This is known as uh, elastic tensor, it is a tensor of rank 4. You may think that you will require 81 elastic constants, but if you look at strain tensor is symmetric, this reduces to 54 elastic constants. If you say stress tensor is symmetric, that it reduces to 36 elastic constants. And if you look at strain energy density function and if you differentiate with respect to epsilon ij, you get sigma ij. This is nothing but another statement of Castiglione's theorem. And the order of uh, differentiation does not matter. So, I have E i j k l is E k l i j this reduces to 21 elastic constants. So, if you have an anisotropic material, you may require 21 elastic constants to characterize an anisotropic material. Look at when I have an isotropic material, I need just two of them. So, it makes your life extremely simple. That is one of the reasons why we want to have analysis of isotropic material, even in situations where it is clearly not uh, isotropic we make that simplification. Then we have also looked at stress strain temperature relations. As long as you do not constrain, you have only thermal strain. The moment I constrain, 
then what I have is I also have stresses developed. And if I want to write the thermal effects affect only the normal strain, I have an additional term alpha T minus T naught. Okay. So, it is actually alpha delta T. It is not affecting the shear strain in case of isotropic materials. Even though we look at what happens to orthotropic or anisotropic material once in a while, our focus in this course is confined to isotropic materials. And you know, we have also looked at uh, what happens to a hoop subjected to a temperature change. And then, uh, you know, we brought in uh, geometric compatibility. We said this tangential strain should be identical in the interface. And we also determine the stresses and we have also plotted. See, across this, you know, you maintain the compatibility of strain at this interface. But when I plot stress, stress can be discontinuous. And in the case of a hoop, we have simply said it is like, you know, you have a circular one it is opened up and then you are actually applying a axial tension. So, it is supporting only a constant stress that you know as PR by T. So, when you plot the stress variation, the variation would be like this. And we have also looked at if you have to strengthen a beam made of a soft material, you can put a steel on top of it, top of aluminum, top as well as the bottom, so that you maintain the symmetry. And when we plot the strain variation, the strain variation is linear. However, when I plot the stress variation, stress variation will have a step at the interface. And the other subtle point is because I am looking at bending, even though the thickness are small, there would be a linear variation because you have the factor y coming in the strain expression as well as stress expression. It is not going to be constant. In the case of a hoop, it is constant. In the case of a bending, it varies linearly even though thickness is small. It is a subtle point for you to note. And you know, we have also looked at uh, basics of photoelasticity. Since now you have the knowledge of uh, stress strain and also principal stresses, what would be the nature of contours of sigma 1 minus sigma 2? We have sigma 1 as sigma x and sigma 2 equal to 0 in one section of the beam. Since sigma x varies linearly, sigma 1 minus sigma 2 contour values always remains positive and if you plot them analytically, you get essentially parallel lines, which is also verified by your photoelastic experiment. So, this is another indirect uh, validation of photoelasticity giving contours of sigma 1 minus sigma 2. So, you have beautiful color variation and we have also seen uh, uh, use of photoelasticity in several other applications and your stress tensor is uh, shown. And you know, we have also looked at uh, how to measure strain. There are multiple methods. The moment you go for measurement, you know, the resolution and range of each of the technique you have to look at. Depending on the capacity of the technique, it has a resolution possible like you have a distance measurement by a scale or a vernier caliper. So, you should choose an appropriate technique that would meet your requirement. If you are working on uh, this range, I can go only for my interferometry. If I work in uh, this range, which is like in a Gudgeon pen, I can go for a grid method. And you can also apply photoelastic coating to reveal the uh, strain patterns and you have the Moire which also gives you displacements. And you have a brittle coating where Normally, you do not uh, want cracks. Here, crack is the information. Crack provides uh, the material fails in a brittle fashion. So, you get contours that are uh, when you draw the tangent to that, you get the principal stress direction. Fine. And uh, you know, a general purpose analysis is possible with a strain gauge, but for special application, you need to go for appropriate experimental technique for strain measurement. And you know, one other discussion in the case of strain gauge is how do I connect the strain gauge in a Wheatstone bridge? If I do not connect them properly, I may get wrong results. In transducer applications, you want to maximize the signal. 
So you know how a cantilever beam behaves because you know bending now when I apply this load this is subjected to tension and this is subjected to compression. So these are strain in opposite direction connect them in adjacent terms so that strain magnitudes get add up. Okay. So you amplify the signal in a transducer application. I can also do the amplification by putting two strain gauges on this but if I do not connect them properly suppose I connect them like this what is the result you will get? You will get uh, twice the signal or zero signal? I will I'll get only zero signal. So, you will also have to handle the Wheatstone bridge appropriately and we have also looked at how to extend this for torsion because strain gauge by itself can measure only axial strain fine and we have understood what way shear stress can be looked at as combination of tension and compression and using that and looking at the Mohr circle you can have the justification using this we have identified that strain gauges have to be aligned at 45 degrees to the axis and connect them appropriately in the Wheatstone bridge so that I can quadruple the signal that is the advantage. So, I can measure torque uh, with uh, much more accuracy when I use that as a torque meter. Okay. You have torque wrenches which measure the torque. So, you have definite applications how do I put them this is very important tied to how I have pasted it on the shaft. Then we moved on to torsion we have looked at uh, circular cross section to understand circular cross section in a simplistic manner we have also looked at a square shaft in a square shaft you have a warping which is absent in a circular shaft that made your life lot more simpler that is the reason why in this course we choose the cross section and the loading so that plane sections remain plane before and after loading. We postpone torsion of circular cross uh, non circular cross section to the next level course. It is not that it is not solved, it is solvable and Saint Vinand is the first person to solve it. Okay. So, plane sections remain plane before and after loading, we have done it by a thought experiment. Okay. And then you can also um, see it visibly when you take a, a simple uh, circular shaft, draw the lines and then twist it. Okay. And we have also a nice animation, you look at the animation, you understand what all we have done for uh, finding out the strain components and this shows the experimental information and this shows uh, the drawing in a systematic manner. So, you find out what is the strain that is existing, you have that as uh, the reference axis is given as uh, r theta z. So, I have only gamma theta z existing that is given as r d phi by d z and gamma r theta is 0 and the gamma r z is 0. I have only gamma theta z which is r d phi by d z. So, we have used this to develop the stresses okay and uh, st strain, stress and equilibrium equations and in the process uh, we have also looked at uh, a quantity like this which when I substitute I get this as r square dA that is your polar moment of inertia and we develop it for a circular shaft. We also extend the same ideas to a hollow shaft. The same ideas are equally applicable for a hollow shaft. And uh, there is also interchangeably use IZ or IP because we, I said that in bending of beams, IZ has a different connotation. So, it is better to look at as IP for uh, circular shaft when you are doing torsion and look at IZ for when you go for the bending of beams or you can simply say that as I if you understand how the equations are developed with respect to the coordinate system. And this is the celebrated equation that you have. This is developed for a circular shaft transmitting constant torque and what we do is when you have a twisting moment, pick out that twisting moment at that uh, cross section, find out the torsional stress. Okay. Then we moved on to bending of beams where we have uh, looked at a very soft beam and we could understand that straight lines get rotated and we have understood uh, you know the 
plane cross sections of the beam remain plane during bending that is what you see here there is no warping and uh, you have uh, cross section which is perpendicular to the undeformed axis of the beam remains perpendicular to the deformed beam during bending that is very important ok. This implies that originally parallel lines the beam gets rotated is very clearly seen in this uh, experimental de uh, demonstration. And when we go into the results, we have the stress and strain in pure bending. It is very important that theory is developed for pure bending, a beam transmitting only bending moment, nothing else. So, we have the expression for epsilon x, we have the expression for the sigma x and we have the stress tensor and this final result is credited to Coulomb. So, you have to recognize that the stress varies linearly over the depth of the beam and the central core is not contributing to load share which is used by nature in developing your bones. Your hemoglobin gets uh, developed in the soft uh, aspects of the bone and we have the relation E by rho equal to MB by IZZ which finally, when you look at all the other expressions, you have the famous flexure formula MB by IZZ equal to minus sigma x by y equal to E by rho because later on we also drop this ZZ just to speed up your writing. The, once you understand the context, what is the axis and what is the kind of moment of inertia talking in this context, it is convenient to simply write and indicate moment of inertia as I. And you have the torsion formula, you compare, they are very, very similar. Fine, it is easy to recollect how these are written. And the other question we raised, can beam theory be extended, extended to a cantilever beam? What is the difference? In the can, case of a cantilever beam, in addition to bending moment, it also transmits a simple constant shear. Even a simple constant shear modifies the bending moment along the length of the beam. So, the recipe here is you have the flexure formula okay, and simply pick out what is the bending moment at this cross section, then you say what is the bending stress using the flexure formula that is permitted. And we have also seen even though the cantilever beam warps, there is no coupling between shear and bending as long as you are having a slender member and the depth of the beam is very small compared to the length. If the depth is comparable to the length, then you can have coupling effects. That is considered as a trimotion co beam and you have different theory developed. Uh, remember such problems are solved, it is not done in this course. And we have also looked at other discussion, how do you have sigma 1, sigma 2 and then whether you have neutral axis and uh, an isotropic material, uh, you know what is the advantage, all this uh, related discussion we have done. You know, whenever we have a beam transmitting a variable load or uh, even your uh, uniform uh, weight, there are multiple ways books bring out the expressions. You know, if I have the W acting upwards taken as positive, I will have the expression dV by dx equal to minus Wx and dM by dx equal to minus V. On the other hand, if I develop the equation with uh, W as acting downwards, the only change is dv by dx goes to wx, it becomes positive. So, you will also have to understand a subtle difference. If you do the mathematics systematically, there is no problem, but if you want to interpret it based on sign convention, you have to see which way you have developed the equations. And one of the subtle points in the case of bending is how shear gets developed. To understand this, we have taken a layered beam and we find they get. Uh, uh, they are slipped okay, as the loading is applied. You could very clearly see slipping of layers and uh, you can also imagine something is holding it that is why the layer is not slipping in a beam which is uh, rotated like this. Okay. Here the rotation is very, very small and this edge remains straight whereas the same height of the beam with four layers, you have this jagged edge that clearly shows there is something is holding the surface. Okay. So, on that basis, we developed uh, the mathematical expression for the shear stress and this also shows 
how much is the angle or the slope when the beam is uh, one unit but with the different layers which brings out very clearly the role of shear in the beam analysis okay and you know even though we have uh, said shear is important there are other concepts also we have, also we have learned a bending stress if you plot it uh, with some scale is triangular and you have uh, compressive and tensile and uh, in order to illustrate that shear stress varies parabolically many books show this big but they do not give an insight what is the relative magnitude that is also very important even if you consider a simple problem of a rectangular cross section subjected to three point uh, bending like this for this problem if you calculate the shear stress in actual magnitude if you plot it is as small as this compared to the normal stress the normal stress created by bending that is the reason even though shear is important in certain instances we are uh, neglecting it because its actual magnitudes are considerably very small in many applications and we have also looked at how to put uh, you know the stress tensor you have the uh, comparison in terms of numbers in terms of tau x y max divided by sigma x max I get this as 1 by half of h by l. So, if I have h by l as uh, if I take this as uh, uh, 1 by 10. So, it is 20 times less okay, compared to the normal stress. So, that is the idea that you should have and we have also looked at how to write the stress tensor at specific location of the cross section. This is the cross section that we are talking about. You can also write the stress tensor. This is compressive, so I have put this as minus sigma x x 0 0 0. And when I have this as the tension side for this problem, I have sigma x x 0 0 0. And when I look at at the center, because this beam is also transmitting a shear force. So, what I have here is I have a 0 tau x y tau x y 0. When bending is maximum, shear is 0. When shear is maximum, bending stress is 0. That is the interesting aspect of uh, what happens in a beam. Suppose I take a point in between, this will have sigma xx, tau xy and tau, tau yx. That is dictated by the problem. Okay. And we have also looked at how to write sigma 1 and sigma 2. You know, we always say that uh, one should be algebraically the largest. When I have this as compressive, this becomes sigma 2. Very subtle point, but it is also very important. That is a convention that we have used. We will always have sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 arranged algebraically larger. Okay. And uh, you know, we have also looked at the inconsistencies in shear stress formula. You have an issue when I have it in the uh, junction. Okay. And nevertheless, we use these expressions because we get the numbers uh, reasonably for us to play with and uh, from your free surface concept you know I should have my uh, this flange this should have zero stress but your shear stress formula does not give it and in the transition region what you have here is uh, this you take the length of the uh, flange and you get a smaller magnitude the moment you come to the web suddenly the stress magnitude increases that is correct that there is no problem the problem comes in other other zone okay and you have this tau xz varies linearly because you take q like this okay and uh, the other important limitation is when i look at here you know this is a free surface i should have a zero shear stress but you have shear stress here and uh, that you will have to take it with a pinch of salt. These are fuzzy zones. Shear has to be 0, but shear formula predicts a small value. But we have already looked at from a mathematical point of view, you may have some number, but if you compare the magnitudes, the magnitudes are very small. And this is a reasonably a simplistic analysis of an open cross section that we could do in the case of beams. From what we have developed for the cross section which has one plane of symmetry, 
we could exploit that flexure formula for a wide variety of problems than what we have learnt it for torsion. Okay. And uh, there is also a very interesting concept once you look at open sections, when you observe this you find that this is bending as well as twisting and uh, when you apply it uh, along the shear center, it only bends okay. and this is uh, another uh, angle cross section. And if you look at this, you know this also bends and twists, the shear center is actually this corner, I was unable to put my pen there, so it was slipping, I just put it next to this. You can very clearly say that this is uh, only bending, there is no twist, but while bending, it has bending in two planes, one plane is like this, another plane is like this, it is also, it is bending like this, it is also bending like this and that we said it is an asymmetrical bending. Is idea clear? When it is bending in two perpendicular axes, you have this as unsymmetrical bending. And we have also looked at uh, another typical cross section used in beams. You have T beams used in many, many applications. This is very interesting from the point of view of writing a stress tensor because you know if you write stress tensor at A, it is very simple, simply sigma x is existing and you also have the expression from your uh, flexure formula. And for the point B, which is on the centroidal uh, axis, which is also the neutral surface, this is made of one material. Okay. So, I have this as only tau x y and tau by x. And when I, we also have the expression tau x y as v q by b i z z. And uh, your uh, typical bending stress variation is like this. And your uh, shear stress variation tau x y is like this. And uh, when you, when you make this as uh, modulated for the actual values, these values are very, very small compared to the bending stress. And when you go to the point C, I have put this as minus sigma xs. And interesting aspect is what happens at a point uh, D, that is what is put here. I have sigma xx, tau xy as well as tau xz, you should recognize that the stress tensor is more populated. Okay. So, we have learnt how to get the expression for stress magnitudes whether it is uh, axial stress, shear stress in torsion or bending stress in uh, bending or shear stress in bending. When you get that as those quantities that appears like scalar, but you should also put it in the matrix form so that you recognize that this is a tensor of rank 2. Not only this, when I have combined loading, if you write it as a matrix form, you can add them if you take the axis appropriately, which we have also solved a problem of a femur subjected to tension, torsion and bending. Combined loading is the order of the day. Any simple problem has only combined loading. We learn them uh, separately. And you know, one of the concepts that I have said that you lack is how to move a force from one point P1 to P2. If you master this, when I move this from P1 to P2, I need to have a force as well as a couple. You can comfortably write the bending moment diagram and shear force diagram. You take more time because you have not mastered this. I am repeating it again and again. And even when you look at a simple uh, tension spring, if you find what is the load which is acting, when I asked you to find out the forces you are struggling to get it, but if you look at how to apply this concept which I am doing it again, when I move it along the axis nothing happens, I can move the force freely along the axis that is principle of transmissibility. But if I move from this axis to this, I have to look at I will have a force as well as an appropriate couple. Okay. Here you are getting this couple in such a manner that this is uh, uh, along the axis, so it is a twisting moment. So, I will have a twisting moment as well as a shear force. Then we moved on to how to analyze the torsional spring. You say torsional spring, but what is the major force it is transmitting? Its major force transmitting is bending. That is again, I have a force here. I move this force 
So this gives me a force as well as a couple. This couple is a bending uh, uh, moment. And when I move from this to this, I have a force as well as a couple. This is a twisting moment. So you have to use this aspect of uh, moving a force from one point to another point. It is not trivial, which is not emphasized in the books. I have emphasized it repeatedly so that you get the idea of this concept better. And you can solve seemingly very complex problems in a jiffy. Now you have the background to analyze these problems. So do not simply say that when I have a sketch like this, a simple spring uh, gets stretched, it is transmitting axial load, do not say that. It is actually transmitting a twisting moment. So this transmits torsion and this transmits primarily bending. So you have to know the difference. And you know, I said that uh, even though I say shear magnitudes are small, it matters when I go very close to the load application point. If at all I apply strength of material solution, I must apply it away from the point of loading. Okay, I must do it only in a zone away from the point of loading. But if I go close to the load application point, this is uh, done from theory of elasticity solution. This is what you have in an experiment. This matches very well with theory of elasticity solution. And look at what happens in the case of uh, strength of materials. It totally misses out this aspect because we have never considered. We have taken shelter under sign Vinon's principle. So you have to consider that near the load application points, the shear magnitudes are very high. Just below the surface, it reaches a peak. At the surface, it is still zero because it has to satisfy that free surface uh, requirement. And these stress magnitudes are comparable to the bending stress. So, failure can definitely happen unless you reinforce these areas. And this is done in practice. People have uh, um, stirrups to support this. And we have also looked at another deviation. Suppose I have a, a uniformly distributed load, which is a common load in all civil engineering construction. You have the self light. And if you look at the strength of material solution, even for a rectangular cross section, which is very well done in strength of materials, is not in order, there is a small variation in your uh, normal stress. It is not linear, but it is having a small nonlinear component. And in addition, we have said in uh, pure bending, there is no normal uh, sigma y stress component, that is correct. But when I have a situation like this, where I have distributed load, I do have normal stress and theory of elasticity accounts for this. And here again, I want to caution you that this is not drawn to scale. None of these quantities are drawn to scale. The focus is only to show the variation, shape of variation. To accentuate the ap appreciation of shape of variation, it is drawn big. If you draw it in real scale, they will appear very small. All these three quantities will appear very, very small. And we have also learned how to analyze a reinforced concrete beam using the same flexure formula. We imagine that the concrete beam is uh, like a, a section like this and the hollow section connected by a thin uh, web. Okay, And uh, that is how we have analyzed it. It is all engineering analysis because only uh, the rods, uh, steel rods take the tension load. Concrete is very weak in tension. And we have also looked at uh, various methods to determine the reflection of beams. So we have uh, double integration E i z z d squared v by d x squared equal to m b. And uh, if you use the interrelationship d m by d x equal to minus v, d b by d x equal to minus w, then I get uh, quadruple integration that is uh, load deflection E i d power 4 v by d x power 4 equal to w. We have been able to take out E i out because we are discussing a beam of uh, constant material and constant cross section. Otherwise, E A would be inside d squared by d x squared will be there. That way also you can analyze. And uh, you know, when you do this uh, double integration or quadruple integration, you get the variation of slope and deflection along the length of the beam con conveniently, no problem. And we have also looked at that this is useful even for statically 
indeterminate problems. Then we also looked at moment area method, method of superposition and energy method. These are applicable for at specific locations if you want to find out the deflection slope, you are in a position to do it quickly. Okay. And moment area method people also say even if I have Ea changes, I have to scale up my bending moment diagram in that region with the appropriate Ea. So, beams of variable cross section or if you change the material, moment area method is also a good choice for you to find out the deflection at specific locations. And one of the aspects in uh, bending is uh, deflection is you have to find out what way the boundary condition to be written for a simply supported end, it will have a slope, it will all it will have deflection as 0. On the other hand, if I go and uh, do that as a fixed end, you find immediately the slope goes to 0. You have deflection is 0, but slope is also 0. And uh, you know, you will also look at what happens in a free end. So, if I have problems of this nature, you should know how to write the boundary conditions. It is needed even for your uh, appreciation of uh, how the deflection can be, because one of the training in this course is to learn how to use method of superposition. There, the training is how to draw the deflected shape. Okay. So, you should uh, practice this and then visualize how the beam can have a deflection. That is a very important idea. It helps you to even uh, verify your mathematical development. Okay. And uh, you know, we have also looked at in the moment area method, you get only the, if you ca calculate the area, you get only the difference in angle of the slopes. You do not get the absolute slope. Okay. Similarly, you get only tangential deviation when I take the moment. If, if I take T B A, I have to multiply by x bar b. If I have T A b, I should multiply by x bar a. I get only tangential deviation. You should know how to use this effectively to get the actual deflection okay, or actual slope. And uh, in the method of superposition, as I said, uh, you know, because we are living in a linear elastic regime, I can superimpose uh, independently and uh, add all of them, analyze the problem independently so that the problem is easy to handle and uh, add them together in a systematic fashion. So, you should know how to draw this deflected shape, you should visualize that, that is one of the important training that you learn in this course. And we have also learned uh, fictitious load method. This is due to Castigliano, he is a very young scientist, you know, he passed away very early in his life. And this uh, theorem was available in his uh, PhD dissertation, it has become very popular. And uh, many developments uh, using energy methods later on uh, owe allegiance to his contributions. So, even if I do not have a particular point, uh, load is acting, if I want to know what is the deflection in a direction or in any other point, I can add a load, in, introduce a load Q, determine the energy and then differentiate with respect to, find out the energy, differentiate with respect to Q, substitute Q equal to 0 at that stage, then what you get is a deflection along that direction for that point of interest. So, very useful method and I also said an extension of this is the development of the finite element method and the experiment is truth. Okay. But when I have the finite element method, I can get the displacement contours, I can get the strain contours, I can get the stress contours, all of that I can do. Okay. And finally, you know, if I plot the stress contours in terms of uh, sigma 1 minus sigma 2, you see this is from an experiment, this is from a final round analysis, the match is very impressive. You can clearly say that my numerical analysis has brought out the results correctly. What is the difficulty here? You know, you have a boundary of the spanner which is very arbitrary. Even though theory of elasticity we have used as a basis to verify our strength of material solution, theory of elasticity demanded how to write the boundary condition in an arbitrary geometry. That was very difficult. It can handle 
simple geometries like circles, ellipses and so on. So, one of the greatest advantage of finite element is I can discretize it using a, an element and handle any arbitrary geometry comfortably, but the solution is approximate, it is not an exact solution, but you go asymptotically to the actual solution and you have many packages available and uh, you can uh, learn some of them uh, as part of your uh, future courses. And ultimately why we have developed all this concept of stress, strain and principal stresses, we wanted to investigate whether the component that I make, whether it will withstand the loads or not, whether it will be strong enough. So, you have uh, failure theories and you have Truska yield criteria, I said if I have uh, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 arranged in this fashion, you will never make a mistake if I have sigma 1 minus sigma 3 is taken and compared with sigma by s. I caution in the case of your uh, simple uh, pressure vessel, both the principal senses are positive. There is every room that you can apply Truska yield criteria wrongly to that. You may simply use sigma 1 and sigma 2. You should not forget sigma 3 is 0. And you should also appreciate failure theory is a substitute for good test data. I said for the complex structures, people develop very expensive loading rigs and only then the design is released for human use because human lives are very precious. And failure theories are based on simple tension tests. How did they approve the theories by conducting complicated experiments and verifying that the experimental results for unknown load situations which have not accommodated in simple tension test also falls within that yield locus or very close to the yield locus. Okay. And for brittle materials because uh, you know for ductile materials you have Trusca, you have one mices which are shown here, one is an elongated hexagon, another is an ellipse and this appears like a circle and a hexagon in the three dimensional sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 space. And I also said that uh, one mises yield criteria is same as uh, distortional energy theory as well as limiting value of the octahedral shear stress. Okay. So, people have verified it from multiple viewpoints and for brittle materials because they have a very uh, different values of uh, tensile yield strength and compressive yield strength, they are very strong in compression and you have a failure locus which is modified by several people. Initially you had one developed by long time back uh, Coulomb, but uh, modified by Ma Moore. Then finally it was modified by Griffith that is also shown here and uh, so you have to use principal stresses very effectively to verify whether a material whether it is brittle or ductile, you have failure theories and you also have uh, in design what is known as factor of safety. I said factor of safety is a very, very important uh, design parameter, even a simple Atta Chekki can throw you surprises. So, when I have this, I have the stress tensor in this form and uh, you can write uh, in the design courses, they simply express it in terms of the bending moment and uh, uh, twisting moment. And because the shaft is rotating, you have to recognize the bending introduces stress nature that varies cyclically because this shows you have the fiber, how the fiber when due to rotation experiences load, which is a very subtle point, okay. You may miss it. And what is the consequence of this? The bending stress on the shaft introduces, introduces fatigue loading as the shaft rotates, in view of this it reduces further the allowable stress and all your uh, design courses basically use what is the principal stresses from this stress tensor and expresses this in terms of your bending moment and uh, twisting moment. So, when I have a shaft transmitting uh, uh, torsion and uh, bending you have a simple expression, they will do and estimate the diameter of the shaft just by using this, there is no torsional stress or bending stress in the expression, they are hidden. Okay. And uh, you do not have to memorize this in your later course, you can derive and P 
people use this in their design books like this. Okay. Then you know we said that uh, when you do not have a warning any failure is difficult to handle. So, one of the functional failure loss is you have a column that suddenly buckles. Okay. There is no material separation, but suddenly buckles and we have seen that this is uh, uh, developed by Euler in 1757 and uh, buckling is one uh, aspect where we have to analyze on deformed coordinate system. Second aspect is the critical load at which buckling tapes is very sensitive to the boundary conditions and we have looked at how the when the boundary condition changes how the shape changes and we also said that uh, these are all new neutral equilibrium positions okay and uh, the experiment gives you truth and this is one of the experiments which is very very expensive and people also found application for the buckling you know engineers are very clever you know they do not leave any physical phenomena go unutilized and you view the critical load from a different perspective you take the hinged hinged column as a basis and you have the critical load as pi square ea by l square e and you visualize other boundary conditions with an equivalent column length if i have a column of fixed pin i view this as equivalent length of 0.7 l if i have a column which is clamped clamped i view this as a column of length 0.5 l and if i have a cantilever i view this as a column of 2 l longer the column more it is prone to buckling okay and you know last but not the least we have one of the best explanation for saint vinan principle in this course because you have been trained to look at uh, photoelastic fringe patterns so in these three cases i have a statically equivalent system applied and what you find is the disturbances die down after a distance and this distance becomes smaller when this distribution is close to the assumed distribution of uniformly distributed uh, uh, is the one which we require. We say that uh, axial load uh, uh, resistance is developed like this and this happens at different distances. See what is the uh, distance that you have to take one thumb rule is it is equivalent to the longest cross sectional dimension. It is only an empirical approach. Okay. There have been many discussions there are also certain specific instances where St. Vinan principle does not work that also you should know. But for a large variety of problems St. Vinan principle is a very useful principle and you are able to relate it easily by looking at the fringe pattern because in a uh, axial load I should have a constant color and how the constant color is obtained you have to look at and uh, this is by St. Minant you know unlike Castigliano he had the longest life about 90 years very active till the last minute very very few people in life are gifted to pursue their passion till the last minute. Okay. So, with these uh, observations uh, you are uh, overview on uh, strength of materials is brought out. So, if you look at these two lectures one after the other in a nutshell you know what are the important concepts that we have looked at in this course. Thank you very much. Thank you.